Hey, hi everyone. This is Dr. John Radke from the Grace Recovery Church in the Buffalo Valley Counseling Center. We're so glad that you are with us today and you uh, have checked out our YouTube and uh, our Twitter and also our Facebook accounts. Uh, you, that's the way we post our videos. We have over 80 videos now on our YouTube station and you can go there just simply by putting my name in, Dr. John Radke. And uh, then you can watch all of our videos that have to do with recovery, 12-step recovery, and also uh, having to do with uh, the sermons uh, that are geared for people in recovery. If you would like to uh, write to us, you, you can and send for some information. We have a wonderful book that we'd love for you to have. It's called The Christian 12-Step Grace Recovery 12-Step Workbook, uh, put out by myself, authored by myself. And this book contains uh, the Christian 12 Steps. It contains everything you need to know to work a 12-step recovery program. And we hope that you will be interested in writing us this, and we'll send you a copy. Uh, if you're a Christian, especially because it's geared for Christians. Uh, our address, our mailing address is 8 Lar Circle, New Columbia, Pennsylvania, 17856. And uh, you can email us as well. Our email address is buffalo seven at ptd.net and we will send you one of these uh, the cost of these books is six dollars that helps us with the production of it and also the shipping uh, but you write to us and we'll mail you a copy or several copies uh, and this will help you in your daily recovery every day well today I wanted to just take some time to do something a little different today normally we read our 12 steps of recovery and we're going to do that uh, in, a, in another video today. But I want to talk to you about a subject that's really, really uh, important for you if you're a recovering Christian. And that is the subject of emotional detachment. I know a lot of people ask me about this all the time. How can I protect myself from an abusive person? How can I uh, protect my feelings, my emotions? Because there are people in my life that, uh, you know, will attack me verbally. Uh, they will, you know, they will say things to me that, that really hurt me. Uh, and so we need to know how to do that. And so we hope that uh, you're going to listen in because I want to share with you a little bit about emotional attachment. I might even put an illustration up on the overhead as we're talking about it just to give you an idea of what it looks like in a graph form. Okay, so first of all, what is emotional detachment? Well, emotional detachment is the ability to get better control of your emotions and protect yourself from abusive people or abusive situations. It is when you, as a person, learn to protect yourself from people, events, and things that can upset you in a given day. Now, you can see how this is so important in recovery because oftentimes, as recovering people, we don't know how to uh, uh, basically uh, manage our emotions. And what happens is we go up and down like a roller coaster throughout the day with our emotional swings, which can cause us to fall into temptation and then fall into back into our addiction. So emotional detachment is important for you if you're a recovering person, or for anyone for that matter. So it's when you learn to get control of your emotions. It's when you learn that no one or no thing can control you unless you allow it to. Let me give you a little story. This is actually a lesson from Buddha. Now, uh, Buddha was a wise Eastern sage, you might say. He was a, he was a, a wise monk uh, who lived in the Far East and he, would, he studied philosophy and Buddha wrote, uh, he wrote some of his teachings and things down. You can still read them today. But there were many people who would come and study under Buddha, young men who would come and live with him and study under him, and they wanted to learn his ways, his ways of wisdom and how to live in serenity, how to live in peace with, with mankind and with life. And uh, one young man came to live with him, and he basically did not, believe that Buddha was uh, authentic. He thought he was a fake. He thought he was he was uh, just not who he said he was. And so he was going to prove that he could crack Buddha, that he could make him 
upset about something. And of course, Buddha was always someone who who uh, taught self-control and self-containment. So during the time that this young man lived there, he tried to be disruptive. He tried to do everything he could to upset Buddha. And uh, he he wouldn't sit correctly at mealtime. He wouldn't eat with his chopsticks the way he's supposed to. Uh, I mean, he just did lots of things to try to upset him. And Buddha never said a thing to him, just ignored all his activities, just went on like everything was fine. But it was at the last dinner when this young man was going to leave the very next day and Buddha turned to this young man and he finally said something to him. He had not spoken to him this entire time and uh, he looked at this young man and he said to him, young man, may I ask you a question? And of course he was excited, he was anticipating, to, uh, he thought, wow, finally I'm going to get Buddha to speak to me and, and I want to see what kind of reaction he has out of all the shenanigans I did. And here's what Buddha said. He said, may I ask you a question? And the young man said, of course. He said, if a person was going to give a gift to another person, but the one who to whom the gift was going to, to be given to, rejects the gift, to whom does the gift belong? So you can see uh, Buddha poses this question. It's a, it's a wise prophecy, kind of like a proverb. And, of course, the young man said, well, it would go back to the person who gave it. Uh, if, the, if the person re uh, who was supposed to receive the gift rejects it, well, then it would go back to the giver, the person who was giving it. And Buddha turns to him and he says, that is correct, young man. He says, you have lived with me now for several months. You have been disruptive. You have been disobedient. You have been absolutely absurd in many ways and uh, disruptive. He says, I have rejected what you have tried to do to me. He says, therefore, it is yours. And of course, at that moment, the young man realized how wise a Buddha really was, that he was the man that he professed to be. And uh, this young man was proven wrong. Now, the principle we learn from this story is simply this. Uh, there are people who try to give you things every day, things you don't want, things you have no power over, but here's what you can do. You can reject what they're trying to give to you. Therefore, it goes right back to them. Isn't that a great lesson? Now, that whole lesson is about detachment. I remember in a, uh, I remember I did this to one of the girls in my office where I work in a hotel. And uh, I said, uh, she said, uh, you know, I really uh, don't get along very well with one of the managers in the hotel. In fact, I dislike them so much because they're always abusive and they say mean things to me, treat me terribly. What do I do, John? And I said, well, let me give you an object lesson. And I tried to teach her about detachment. I said, I took a scissors uh, from the drawer that was sitting in front of me. Excuse me, I've got something in my mouth here. And so I have a scissors right here. So I pull this scissors out, and I open it up like this, open the blade up like this. And then I said, now, I want you to put your hand out, put your hand out, and I'm going to hand you the scissors. So I had her hand out like this, and I pointed the scissors at her with the blade out like this. I said, now... I said, I want you to take that scissors. And she says, well, I'm not going to take that scissors. And I said, why not? She said, because you have the dangerous end toward me. That could cut me or hurt me if I take it like that. She said, why aren't you handling it, handing it to me with a handle like this? See, I could handle it that way, but I didn't. I handed it to her to take it like this, see, this direction. And I said, well what are you going to do? And she says, well, I'm not going to take it from you. And I said, why not? She says, because it could hurt me. And I said, now, this scissors represents that person that you're having a problem with, that boss. And I said, now, she's trying to give you things, say things to you that are hurtful. She says things that are hurtful, but they're only hurtful because you allow them to be hurtful. See, she's trying to give you things, negative things, abusive things. She's doing that just like the scissors, see? Now, you have a choice. 
what you can do is you can reject what she's giving you, and if you reject it, then you aren't going to take it, and therefore it goes right back to her. It goes right back to the person who's giving it. And I said, now that is what we call emotional detachment. And she says, wow, she said, I get that, I understand that, that makes a lot of sense. So I said, so, so you see, what I was saying to this young lady, um, people try to give you things every day, things that you, that you don't want, things that you have no power over, things that aren't really yours, that they try to give you, uh, and, and even situations can do that to you. But you have the you have the power within your mind and your body to reject it. You don't have to accept it. You can reject it, and when you reject it, therefore it goes right back to the person, or it goes back to the situation. And this is why we we say the Serenity Prayer every day. Remember, uh, God help me to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference between those two. So you see, detachment is actually part of the serenity prayer. Uh, help me to accept the things I cannot change. So, why do we need to learn about detachment? Well, if we don't learn detachment, we will be sitting ducks for abuse and attacks, not only from the devil, from, the, from people around us, or just daily circumstances in our life. And if we don't learn how to control our emotions, then we will be out of control and we will allow others to control us, which will affect our happiness every single day. So you see how important this is in recovery? Well, is detachment found in the Bible? Well, it sure is. It's found in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to verse 18. Jesus taught his disciples to detach. Listen to this verse. <coughs> Excuse me. In Mark chapter 6, verse 11, here's what it says. And whoever does not receive you, nor want to hear you, he said, depart from them and shake off the dust under your feet as a testimony against them. So there's one verse that talks about detachment. But listen to what he says in Ephesians, what Paul writes about the armor of God. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the might mighty power, put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your guard. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then uh, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist and with a breastplate plate of righteousness in place. And uh, it says, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Now, there you have it. Paul talks about emotional detachment. He talks about putting on your armor every day. How important this is for the Christian. It's really important for us in recovery. We need to put our armor on every day. If we don't, the devil is going to get us. He's going to tempt us. We're going to go back to using our addiction. Uh, we're going to relapse. And so we need to put on the armor of God, don't we? Yes, we do. Now, what are some of the sources of attacks? Where do attacks come from? Well, we live in a fallen world, obviously, so sin has a destructive and decaying effect on us, and uh, disappointing circumstances happen every day because something will probably go wrong. Catastrophes or catastrophic events happen in our world. Look at what just happened over in Ecuador, a huge 
earthquake just leveled Ecuador in certain areas. Oh my gosh, what devastation. And then we have to deal with people every day, people that we work with, people we go to church with, people who are selfish, people who are self-centered, and sometimes people who are abusive. And then there is the devil, Satan. He is our enemy. The Bible says he hates us and he wants to destroy us, so he'll try to set us, set traps up for us so he can bring us down. So Satan hates God and his creation and will do whatever he can to disrupt God's plan. In fact, the Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 8, it says, Be sober and be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, uh, seeks whom he may devour. He walks around seeking whom he may devour, and that's you and me. So, sources of attacks, they can come from the world, they can come from people, they can come from circumstances, they can come from Satan, and sometimes, we might add, they even come from ourselves. Sometimes we set ourselves up for a fall. Sometimes we put ourselves in the wrong place at the wrong time where we shouldn't be in recovery and we end up falling into temptation because we aren't supposed to be there. Now, let's do the ne let's ask the next question. What's our normal reaction to these attacks? Well, when we're hurt, typically we want to hurt back, don't we? We want to get even. We want to see justice. We want to see swift punishment for people who hurt us. So, how do we learn a proper response? Well, I want to give you five questions that you need to ask yourself when you are being attacked, and these five questions will help you in the process of emotional detachment. Remember, that's what we're talking about. What are those five questions? Well, the first question is pretty obvious. It's really basic. What just happened to make me upset? Very simple question. What just happened? <clears throat> and then secondly, what uh, do I need time? That's the second question. Number three, do I need space? Number four, do I need r to reflect? And number five, am I ready to respond? Now let's build, let's look at each one of these, okay? The first one is, what just happened to me to make me upset? Well, what we're saying is that you need to find the source of the problem. Was it a person? Was it a circumstances? Maybe you got up in the wrong side of bed. Maybe you're just not feeling good today. Is it a person, a place, or a thing? Is it me? Maybe I'm doing it. Maybe it's the devil. Maybe it isn't. A lot of times Christians want to blame all their problems on the devil. It's, sometimes it's not the devil. Sometimes it could just be a, a person who is sinful and is, a, is really giving you a hard time. So the most important thing, first of all, number one, step number one, question number one, what just happened to make me upset? We need to stop and really reflect on what happened and why am I upset. Most people don't. Most people don't really take the time to really reflect to find out why am I upset and you ask them say why are you upset and they go I don't know I don't know it's because they never really thought about what just happened what are the events that just led up to why you got upset that's simple simple question okay question number two do I need time uh, what does that mean well when we get upset when we get hurt we need, we need to give ourselves time, first of all, to identify what happened. And then secondly, we need to have time to kind of calm down, a time to cool off, a time to think about how upset I am, but then think about how I'm going to respond instead of react. So maybe you need to count to 100. Maybe you need to calm down and get control of your emotions. Maybe you need to regroup. Uh, you, you, maybe you were caught off guard, or maybe you need to make a plan of escape. Maybe you need to think of a place of how can I get out of there? See, uh, in fact, in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, I love that verse because it talks about an escape route. When somebody, somebody verbally attacks you, you don't have to stand there and take it. Uh, you can actually leave the room. You can go to another place. I think one of the greatest places, the best places to ever detach is the restroom. Uh, go in the restroom, go in the bathroom stall, lock the door, and uh, there you can be alone. No one's going to bother you there, hopefully, right? 
Uh, but here's this verse. Listen to this verse. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under the attack of it. So that is a great thing to do. When you're being attacked under the area of emotional detachment, think about it an escape plan. Think about a way that you can get out of there. So you need to have time. You need to have time to think about that. And the next question, number three, is do I need space? And that goes right along with our previous verse. Maybe you need to remove yourself. Maybe you need to go somewhere in another room. Uh, go in the car for a nice long ride. Calm down. Listen to some, some music. Actually, listening to music, putting headphones on, actually creates a, a space. It creates uh, an emotional and intellectual space uh, so where you can put your mind and focus on something else. You see sports figures doing this all the time. Just before the game and after the game, they have earphones on with their headsets, and they're listening to their iPads and their telephones, and they're listening to music that they pre-recorded. The reason they're doing it is that because they want to focus uh, not on what's happening in front of them, but they want to relax so that when they get to the game or they perform, they're going to be able to perform at a higher level because they're relaxed. So, do I need space? Maybe I need to put distance between myself and the abuser or the abusive situation. Uh, go to another room. Lock yourself in the bathroom. I said that earlier. Take a drive in your car or turn on some music and put on earphones. Those are f five suggestions of how you can create space. So, that's point number three. Point number four, question number four in the process of det emotional detachment is, do I need to reflect? Now, reflection is important. When you get hurt, you need to remove yourself from that situation, and then you need to really think about what just happened, uh, who, who, would the, who did this, and uh, how did this make me feel, and uh, then we need to reflect on some very important points, and that is, what does God want me to do with this? What is if I'm a Christian? What is God? How does God want me to react? And uh, here's what I need to say to myself during a time of reflection, and things that I should remember that God says about me. Very important. You can write these down, and I'll put them on the screen. Uh, you are deeply loved. That's the first one. God loves you deeply. Secondly, you are totally accepted by Christ. Now, does this sound familiar? Yes, it does, because it's in our statement of identity in our workbook. Number three, you are completely forgiven. You need to remember, remind yourself of that. And number four, you are a new creation in Christ. Four important things to reflect on when you feel that you have been abused and attacked. Uh, let me tell you a quick story. Uh, there was a young lady that I was counseling with, and uh, she had been married, and uh, her husband had been divorced, and this was this, her his second marriage, her first marriage. And they used to go out to dinner. They used to go out to lunch, and uh, sometimes the father, the husband would invite his mother uh, along to to lunch. And this this young lady told me that when every time they'd sit down to a lunch somewhere, the mother-in-law would proceed to talk about the her uh, her husband's first wife. She would say, oh, remember, honey, remember the time when you and Jill, we'll just make up her name, Jill went here and you had such a great time. And she would do this right in front of the other wife. And, of course, the wife came in for counseling. She says, I'm furious with my husband because I tell him he needs to tell his mother to shut up and, uh, you know, to stick up for me and stand up for me and not put up. But he's a wimp and he won't do it. She says, so what should I do? And I said, well, you have a problem with detachment. So you need to learn how to detach. And uh, so I, I told her about seeking some space. You know, do you need time? Do you need space? And I said, now... Next time she does it, when you're out to lunch, excuse yourself from the table, get up and go to the ladies' room, and come back after you have reflected, after you have said these 
four things. You know, I'm deeply loved, I'm totally accepted, I'm completely forgiven, I'm a new creature in Christ. And when I feel I'm ready to go back, I'll go back. And so that's exactly what she did. Her mother-in-law started talking about his, his, her husband's first wife, and she said, excuse me, I need to go to the ladies' room. And she just got up and went to the ladies' room, and she was in there for about 10 minutes. And she, she came back, and they said, are you okay? And she goes, oh, yeah, I'm fine now. I'm fine, because she was ready. She wasn't going to sit there and listen to her mother-in-law talk about uh, her, you know, her husband's ex-wife. Well, her mother-in-law started it up again, and, of course, what she said was, excuse me. I need to go to the ladies' room. So she got up and did it again. And she told me over the course of the lunch, this happened three times. Three times she got up and dismissed herself from the table. And when she came back the third time, her mother-in-law understood. She got it loud and clear that the, the wife was not going to allow her to talk about the first wife and embarrass her and make her feel uncomfortable and so every time she did she was going to dismiss herself and remove herself and go to another room now that is emotional detachment so you don't have to sit there and take it you can get up and remove yourself and go to another place so now we go back to responding and to to reflection see we need to reflect on who we are who God says we are the person who hurts you uh, the situation hurts you. It is not telling the telling you that you're an awesome, great person. It's telling you just the opposite: that you're no good, that you're you, you know you're you're uh, you're a mess, uh, that uh, you blew it again, and that you'll never make it. See, this is why it's so important for recovering Christians, because we go through this every day where we are attacked by situations that make us feel bad and we need to keep reflecting on what God says. That's why I tell people that you need to memorize the statement of identity in our book and memorize it and put it to memory so it's right there so you can think about it every day. Now, once you've reflected, the last thing, the last step in, re in, in emotional detachment is, am I ready to respond? That's the fifth question. Am I ready to respond? So. Uh, sometimes I never, I never want to react. I never want to react to the person's situation. See, a reaction is when I'm going to hurt you back. You hurt me, I'm going to hurt you. You threw a punch at me, I'll throw a punch back at you. That's what most people do in a situation. But we don't want to react because that isn't Christian. That's not what God wants us to do. Make sure that you're calm and under control and make sure you have reflected on God's statements. And then even say the serenity prayer and pray for God's peace and your confidence. And then go and respond. Now maybe the response will be you might just need to go to that person and talk to them calmly. Why did you do that? Why did you say that? That was unnecessary. Or maybe your response would be to go to God in prayer and say, Lord, I give this person to you. I give this situation to you. Maybe the response is to just let it go. Give it to God. Give it completely to him and just move on and say, God, you're in control. You know what's going on. I'm not going to let this upset me, you see. Uh, but again, remember, you need to say that serenity prayer because there's some things that you can control, some things you can change, but then there's other things you can't. And so that's the way that you respond. So that's the fifth step in the, in the five steps of emotional detachment. <clears throat> How should I respond? Well... I might need to go to that person in humility, just like Jesus would. I maybe need to go to the source of the problem and ask for God's direction. I may need to pray about the, the parts I can't change, or maybe I just need to let it go and uh, let, let go of any anger, resentment, and give it to God. So emotional detachment is so important in our life. And it works if you work it. You need to practice it every single day. Practice it because practice makes perfect. And uh, there are a lot of Christians who are sitting ducks. There are a lot of recovering Christians who are sitting ducks and they get hurt every day. And they're like a, they're like a ping pong ball bouncing off of walls because they're reacting to things in their life. So I'm hoping that you're going to study Ephesians, that passage in Ephesians. Put on the armor of God every day and ask God to help you with emotional attachment. I think this is a very important subject, and that's why I'm making this lecture today, uh, so that you can start to work on this in your recovery every day. Well, God bless you. Uh, we hope that this tape has helped you. If you need any help, 
please write us. Our address is 8 Lar Circle, New Columbia, Pennsylvania, 17856. And this is Dr. John Rackey. If you'd like one of these books again, you can write to us. We'll send you one of the Grace Recovery books to help you in your recovery as a Christian. And I hope that you have a great week, and God bless you.